All right, so uh, I'm Brian Cardell, and we've been discussing things about the health of the web ecosystem. There's always this sort of wide discussion, usually when something bad happens, like we lose an engine or something. And we talk about what this means for the health of the web, but this is actually a pretty poor proxy beyond some things that seem almost self-evident, like one engine is certainly too few. <laughs> Uh, and probably 100 is too many. And beyond that, it gets into all kinds of different nuance that we don't talk about so much. So that's we've been talking about all those different angles and nuance and everything from different perspectives, like how is the development work funded and why is it funded that way? And is that good or bad? Have we seen any changes? The move of everything to open source. Originally, everything was proprietary and then became all open source. And like, how does that play into it? So I have some guests today that we're going to talk a little bit more about the standards themselves and how they get made and how the standards process works and who's involved with that. So hi, I'm Miriam Suzanne, and it's good to be here. Thanks, Brian. Hi, and I'm Rachel Andrew. And yeah, it's, it's really good. It's an interesting discussion to be having. So it's really good to be here. I guess let's talk about like how who works on standards, basically. Uh, I don't know how much people really think about or talk about that. Like we know Google does, right? We know Apple does, and we know Mozilla does. And at different times we had Microsoft and Opera and some different players and to different degrees. There's, there's a lot of people working on on this stuff that I think the web development community probably aren't that aware of. So there are other user agents as well as browsers, uh, as well as web browsers. So we have things that output to print, for example. So there's lots of uh, publishers who are using CSS, for example, uh, to output books. And they're all the people in the EPUB community. You know, they're using the same standards and, and they input into them. And um, so that's kind of one group of people who I think we don't necessarily think about when we talk about the ecosystem, um, because because those those things do feed in to, you know, if we're talking about a CSS property, for example, you know, we might need to think about how that works with um, with print. Um, and how that's going to work in, in that kind of output. So that's a bunch of people. And then we have you know, the people who are like, like myself and, and Miriam who don't actually work for a browser vendor or, or a publisher um, and are kind of independent and yet have sort of somehow ended up involved in, in working on the web platform. And th there's a growing number of people who are involved in that way. Yeah, and then interestingly, there's also sort of like Adobe is very involved, right? They're not... They're not a, a vendor in any sense of using the specs to create some output. They're just an interested party. I mean, that's it. There's, there's an awful lot of sort of companies and organizations who are sort of adjacent to, to this stuff um, and use some of it, if not all of the platform. Um, and so that's, I think, not as well understood by people who aren't involved in, in standards bodies. I think that there is actually some interesting history around Adobe and like why and how they got involved. Like kind of everybody thought for a while that we we're going to get the better web like the html web was really good for documents and but this kind of model where you have this vm that has the ability to have like windowing toolkits and things where you write programs but it also supports documents there were all kinds of entries into this trying to win to control the market by being the first one to just define it without actually getting the standard and so from that we had like uh zool and xaml and adobe had flex and all of them had their own vm that worked like this and right at the very end of this Adobe launched their VM and it embedded WebKit. When WebKit came out and everyone was like working on it very actively, I, th I kind of think that's how Adobe got involved. But yeah, uh, Egalia also works on a lot of embedded things and embedded devices are everywhere. Like, you know, e everybody thinks about the browser you use on your desktop and then you have the browser you use on your mobile phone. But you also use browser on your TV. You don't realize that if you have smart appliances, they probably are running browsers. Your car infotainment system, airplane, train, digital signage, point of sale systems. I mean, there you probably encounter seven other things built on web technology that are that you're not even realizing are browsers. And like lots of those people are increasingly also involved in standards. Yeah, I mean that was what I mean for a couple of years I was the uh, DE three representative on the on the AC for Frontiers and um going to the the meetings, the DE three C meetings, you realize actually how how much broader the web is than what 
you know most web developers and what really i thought for, for a long time you know you sort of think of yeah web browsers and uh, and and it's incredibly broad the number of, of companies and organizations that are using web technologies these days um, and and that's that's kind of really interesting because we don't hear a lot of, of those sort of stories yeah let's let's talk about that since you mentioned frontiers because um, over the years the w3c uh, I talk about this a lot none of these standards bodies are fixed in their design they're always like constantly evolving and one of the things that happened a number of years ago is things got a lot more open and they wanted, you know, more people who can bring different points of view and expertise. And they created this invited expert. So you don't have to work for a big company to participate and come to meetings and all that kind of stuff. So you were eventually nominated, but I think that like lots of people started as invited experts. Yeah, I mean, I so I'm now back to being an invited expert. So I was I originally became a member of the CSS Working Group as as an invited expert sort of. Um, during the time when when Grid was was leading up to shipping, because I'd done a kind of a bunch of really kind of advocacy work a, a, around Grid and just encouraging web developers to look at the emerging spec and then also sort of contributing a bit back to to the spec, you know, sort of with ideas and things that I'd, I'd picked up from talking to, to developers. And so at that point, I was asked to become an invited expert. And what I always say to people is, you know, if you become an invited expert to a working group, you basically get an expensive hobby <laughs> uh, because, you, you know, you're not paid for this. Um, and as uh, you know, I, I'm a I'm a freelancer. I, I work on contracts. And so any time I'm spending working on on standards, I'm doing in my own time, typically. And I'm paying for going to meetings uh, and so on. And, you know, uh, I've been in a position I've been able to do that. And one of the things that sort of then came about was that Frontiers wanted to join as a member organization. And for people who don't, don't know this, basically to, to become a member of the W3C, typically that's a company. So that might be a company like Google. Um, or it might be quite a small company, you know, one of these publishers or, or what have you might be a member of the W3C. And that lets you then send people to meetings and, and, and be sort of fully involved. So if you're a W3C member as an organization, you need to have at least one representative um, who sort of ferries information and so on. So I became that person for Frontiers. So for a couple of years, they kind of funded some of my standards activities, which was great. And I did stuff with them like spec reading workshops and, and so on. But it's not... The W3C is not really set up for non-corporate members so much. Um, I, yeah, it's very expensive to join. It's it's very expensive, and and just the whole the whole system is very much set up for, you know, you being a representative who is has got a remit of a company behind you, and you're going to sort of bring the information from the W3C back to the company and and bring the company's interest into the W3C. It was very difficult to figure out the model for an, a, a volunteer organization and and being being their member. And of course, with the whole coronavirus thing, it meant that I couldn't do a lot of activities that I might have done in the sort of second year um, of my term with them. So I'm now back to being an invited expert. They've decided not to renew their membership. But it's kind of an interesting thing. And that whole situation, I kind of feel like there needs to be another way to be a member almost. <laughs> um, that, that enables talented people to get involved with standards processes without having to fund it themselves, because that means that only, you know, I'm in a position of privilege that I have been able to fund my standards activities, that I've been able to have that hobby. I couldn't have done it, you know, 15 years ago or so when my daughter was younger. There's no way I could have funded it. So I think that is a, a something that needs discussing, really. Yeah, it's been interesting joining recently. I mean, I joined right when COVID started or right before. Mm. And I can say that makes it cheaper, you know? I don't have to pay for travel to the meetings. But downsides, too, of course. But in filling out all the paperwork, and there's a fair amount of legal making sure that uh, your work for the CSS Working Group is all public domain, that you don't retain any rights to the work. And a lot of the questions were around... Is there any way my company could become a member? And if so, that would have to be the path. So a lot of sort of arguing that no, Oddbird doesn't have any particular reason to become a member besides the fact that I've been invited to do this work and I'm not strongly affiliated with Mozilla or Google or Apple or uh, anyone else that's already a member. Yeah, this can get complicated as well because uh, you certainly, well, it's a special skill for you. 
wind up doing something somewhat specialized like spec writing which i, I would like to get to that as a topic in, in a little bit but spec writing is a sort of a specialized skill but just you know consensus seeking and and like learning the ropes of how these things work and kind of getting good at it and once you've been doing that for a while everyone would hate to lose you and that occasionally happens where uh, a company is involved and then there's something like the coronavirus and they say we we can't be involved anymore but some of those people who are really critical we we want them to be <laughs> remain yeah. involved and this creates a real uh, a real tricky situation because paying into the membership because that's mm. how they fund themselves we actually covered some of this on previous podcast if you want to go listen to it with uh, jory and pia i think it was two podcasts ago where we talked about some of the funding of the standards bodies themselves and how they operate but then sort of we are the back door right i mean as invited <laughs> yeah, experts i mean, it's, I mean it, it, it's it's a bit of an odd situation i mean because I mean, for instance, I currently, I mean, I say I'm a contractor. I currently work for both as a, on a contract for both Mozilla and and Google. And most of that work, I'm actually working on NDN um, on behalf of, of both companies. So you know, I, I have affiliations with two browser vendors. Yet I'm not on the CSS working group for either of those companies, and I'm not. They're not paying me for any of the work that I I would do there. I've kind of sort of if I can get work that aligns with my interest in in standards, then I, that kind of helps because I feel like well, okay, so I'm doing this this other work in my own time, uh, but at least everything I do is around the same subject, and I'm thinking about it all the time, which is great. And there, I know that there are several of us that are getting money through either through contracts or through open funding. Um, from the browser vendors, even though we don't have a strong affiliation with them. I don't work for Google, but Google has a fund uh, where they pay for open source work, and I do get some of my work paid for through that. And I think that's a common thing for some of the invited experts. On that whole, like, invited experts are the backdoor. They are kind of a backdoor, although they're a backdoor into, as Rachel said, having a very expensive hobby. <laughs> Not just very expensive in terms of like billable time but to be a really good productive member of something like css working group like takes substantial time especially if you start working on specs yeah yeah that's what i was just gonna say like actually write specs or work something through the spec process or do the things that are involved with that like collaborating with implementers to find out what is and isn't plausible and why and yeah. how, how we fix that that is all really, really time consuming and frequently operates on a time scale that is like way outside of anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's what I, why I try and work on on adjacent work. So, what, you know, I'm working on MDN typically, so I'm documenting the web, um, which at least means I'm constantly thinking about this stuff um, and um, interacting with with web developers and talking to them about it. Um, and answering their questions. And so that kind of means that although I'm not actually paid to be on the CSS working group, I'm actually thinking about this stuff all the time. So then when stuff comes up in a, a working group discussion, I don't have to go and research it because I've probably just written the docs and MDN about it. Um, <laughs> so that that kind of helps. But I realize I've, I've sort of got myself into a fortunate kind of position there where I can balance um, my expensive hobby with my actual paid work in a way where both feed into each other, uh, which they obviously do. Uh, where it's not so good is that actually the specs that I work on, I mean, multi-call is, is also interesting to, to some people on the web, uh, but my, a big area of interest for me are those specs that are interesting to, to publishers. Um, now, the, now, publishers don't have money to fund um, spec writers, so, <laughs> so I'm unlikely to get money to, for instance, work on page floats. If I'm going to work on page floats, I'm probably going to have to sit and do that in my own time uh, because there's nobody to fund that work, really. Um, it's not, it's sort of, I guess, fairly niche, although there's a whole, there's an awful lot of people uh, would like to have that worked on. Um, they just don't have anything to pay for it. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an interesting aspect of this that I think is it, it takes, effectively, it takes money <laughs> to uh, pay people for their time, which is a good thing. Like, I mean, the, your labor should be compensated, right? Like, we shouldn't take each other for granted and have require super heroic people to do years worth of work for free and so we have found lots of ways to 
like fund that. But then there's also this thing about like membership. And once you're a member, it's not just sort of your time. It's also, as Miriam said, like travel. Uh, you have to maybe travel to face to face meetings and you cannot like you always could not travel. There's always like ways to attend virtually like, to try to compensate and make that possible. But once you get into it, you realize like there is a huge, huge, huge benefit to like being in the room with people. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the hallway conversations. Yeah, it's, 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 the co it's the coffee break yeah. conversations. Uh, that's what we've really found, I think, with, with doing all this virtually. We can do the cracking through issues and resolving on things, but we don't have the conversations over coffee where someone says, you know, I've been thinking about this thing. And someone else goes, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about that too. And here's my take on it. And that doesn't happen virtually. And if you're not, if you're a virtual person dialing in, you miss out on all of that, you know, when there's an actual physical meeting happening. Yeah. And then and then somebody from across the table who wasn't even part of the conversation and you you think that the the area that they're from that would not even have interest in this, suddenly they chime in and they say, oh, no, I'm very interested in this. Like, mm. And uh, I think that that's the way that a lot of things get movement and interest and momentum in a way mm. um yeah and i think again it comes down to this sort of this 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 privilege of being able to be involved with this and if we say to people oh yes you can be an advice expert we know you can't afford to travel but that's okay you can dial in we're almost relegating that person to a kind of being a sort of second class member almost because they miss out on all of that stuff and that's not a great situation it shouldn't be a case of oh well you can pay for your travel so you can be fully part of us when, you know, a lot of those people are being paid by their companies to be there. That seems wrong to me as well. And it's something I, I think would be great to solve so that if you find a talented person who could be working on standards but can't afford to, that there is a way to say, here, we can fund you to do this. We can get you here. We can fly you to this meeting that happens to be in Japan this time. Because otherwise it, it becomes, you know, it, it's a diversity thing. It's, you know, if, if you're only saying that, that those who've got the means to, to have this expensive hobby can be involved, that that's just wrong. Right. It also changes what's being worked on. Because you mentioned earlier, if you're most interested in those specs that are mostly for publishing and publishers mm -hmm. have less money, I mean, budgets are not evenly distributed across the membership. It's very clear that say Google is bringing the most funding to this because they can. And then now with Google and Microsoft working together on Blink, uh, there's sort of a sense that Blink can do anything and get way out ahead. Yeah. And it's what they're interested in then that gets funded. Yeah. Gets yeah. I, I actually think that that's really critical and it's a huge part of the ecosystem health that we've been trying to talk about. So what's interesting is that like, it's one thing to be a browser and it is another thing to be able to have sort of like the quality of interaction and involvement that you need to make something happen. And they're not they're not exactly identical. So everything requires some funding and it is rather expensive to join the W3C. But a lot of companies do that. I mean, like there are about 500 member organizations and they join for various reasons. And as we said, it, it's not cheap. It's not cheap. There's the membership fee itself, which is not cheap. But then there's also travel and um, somebody to, you know, to like act. You have to actually pay your time, which is maybe a day a week for a single working group. But a lot of people are on multiple working groups. And again, the better you get at it, the more places you get involved in. And maybe, for example, run for the technical architecture group or the advisory board or something like that. And that's a whole nother big commitment. It gets to be a lot. And so what's interesting about this is that in the, I would say like fairly recent past, it's become more and more common for people to hire people like both of you who specialize in some aspect of this and can help them navigate that process. I think also a lot of people don't realize Elika or Fantasy on the CSS Working Group who is on like a million specs and I would say is probably, you know, one of the key CSS working group members mm -hmm. that has the best grasp on all of the things at the same time. Florian, who also is involved in a, a lot of specs. Uh, Amelia, who does uh, SVG. All these people are that. Like we're sort of um, experts in this. 
that you can hire to help your company do these things without sort of having a whole division of your company necessarily that is full-time on this making a browser more or less. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really good. And Agalia does the same thing, not just for specs. We, we also do specs, but, but for implementations, because one of the key factors in this is if you want to talk about the specs, that's great. But if you can't get it implemented, it's not worth much. <laughs> Knowing that we don't have the resources to get the implementation queue really stalls a lot of conversations. So I think these are like really and positive developments actually for the, the health of the whole thing. I agree. And I think I, I, I think that, you know, particularly companies like Agalia, I think that's, that's been incredibly helpful. I, I sort of came across Agalia when I was sort of working on, on the grid stuff because I, I was actually speaking at um, a conference, uh, CSS Conf, about about grid sort of when it was really just just starting to be implemented into into chrome by by agalia and they were there they, <laughs> um the people who were working on it were actually there at the conference and so i was speaking about it. they were super excited because i was talking about this thing that they were working on and trying to get sort of author interest and and so i sort of you know came across this that, that that's what was going on and, and understood the story about how bloomberg were were spon sponsoring that which i had not come across before and so I think that's that's an interesting thing that there can be as well sponsorship from outside, you know, from some other company, then paying a company, you know, like Egalia to work on on some implementation. You know, that that struck me as very interesting. I think the thing about the contractors, about individuals, um, and there are, you know, several individuals on, on the working group who are sort of paid as contractors. And the issue with that is well, how does somebody how does an independent person get from probably having the ability to work on this stuff to being in a position where a company is willing to pay them to work on this stuff? Because there's quite a ramp up to understand just how standards organizations work um, and to learn how to write specs and to learn how to contribute. And to actually, if you're a person who's got that body of work behind them, you're probably someone like me who, you know, is in a position to sort of to find out where they might get paid or get paid for adjacent things like I do. I don't get paid specifically to work on specs, but I get paid to write about them. And, you know, what happens to what 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 does that new person who doesn't have any funding and doesn't have a huge amount of experience, but just is good at this? What's their track? How do how do we get them into this? How do they get to be a contractor on this stuff? And currently, it's almost like you have to be yeah. discovered or something. Like somebody has to come to yeah. you and you know you kind of almost have to be granted your... this. And again, it, it's it's people who are in a position of privilege yeah. who are, are likely to be able to to spend the time to get to that point. Um, so that kind of I think is is an interesting sort of facet of this. Yeah, it definitely is. And I like I would like to even talk a little bit about like how all of us and even some other people who we now associate with the the web platform, like how did they get involved? So I know like Tab Atkins got involved before he worked at Google, mm -hmm. showing the talent for that and a good understanding of things is like how he eventually became the, I think the only editor actually employed by Google, which is interesting all on its own. But yeah, like how, how did you wind up? I, because in my conversations, it's frequently, it does require some sort of um, heavy investment in a very expensive hobby and then also luck, but like a mm. lot of luck yeah. and, um, and privilege. There's even cultural aspects to this, right? Mm. Like um, if you go to a meeting and, you speak up and you have what people in to it as intelligent insights or things to say or something mm -hmm. maybe something about your background also like heavily influences the things that you would do to get into that position where you could be i don't know like as miriam said sort of discovered yeah i mean i think i think that's i mean certainly for myself i mean i got involved in um sort of web platform stuff via the web standards project so i was writing about sort of web standards and and so on in sort of 2000 and got invited to be a member of the web standards project in 2001 so i've essentially built my career around sort of web standards and the open web and the importance of that and so everything i've written about and you know, and the work I was doing as a web developer kind of was based on that. And I think that's, so that's really, I guess, why people 
have known about me and then the fact that I've just written a huge amount of stuff. So <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to uh, read stuff about CSS without stumbling over something I've written about it, um, particularly around layout, which and that goes back a very, very long way. So that was kind of my in, really, was just by being someone who writes a lot. Um, and the, the, the public speaking came a lot a lot more recently than that. It was it was mainly writing, and that was that was kind of how I got known for for knowing about these things, I guess. Yeah, for me, uh, I mean, I was always interested in standards, but I I would say I thought of myself more as a consumer of them and a, a teacher of them. Um, I didn't really get involved in the process until very recently, but. Uh, I just built some tools and shared them and I built Suzy, which was using SAS, which again, I mean, it's these similar problems are in the open source world, right? Like I was able to do that because I had certain privileges to be able to afford to spend some of my free time and to have a company that supported me spending some company time on these open source tools. And really, I, I think regularly I'm here because Oddbird has been sort of insistent that we want to be part of the community and Miriam's interested in that, make her do it. So uh, the company has been very supportive. I've been working there for uh, almost 15 years now and it's why I'm here is because I was able to put in that time. And then, you know, Mozilla noticed Jen Simmons. I got to work with her on uh, the Mozilla developer channel and I made a proposal for a spec based on the work that we were doing there, teaching the Cascade. And uh, that got me invited to the working group. But I still couldn't contribute much because I didn't really have funding for it. Oddbird was paying me some, but couldn't afford to have me spending full time on it. Uh, and then Google came along and said, what if we pay you to put more of your time into this? So it is that sort of having the privilege to get started and then uh, somebody notice you and sort of like the hand of God pull you up yeah. and... <laughs> fund you and make it happen yeah i mean that's it there's so many kind of things where i think back it, it's it's been a bit of luck it's been because i mean, in, in my case a lot of it has just been that i'm willing to work very long hours and and so i've you know done my contract work and then i do my other work you know whether that's you know web standards advocacy in the early days or you know the stuff with the css working group or, or what have you and again you know I, i'm in a position where i'm able to do that and um, I've been doing it for 20 odd years and I'm not planning to stop. Um, but but not everybody's in that situation, you know, in terms of their other commitments and, and what have you. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to, to discuss, really, because we've got a bunch of people. I mean, it's the same as with a lot of open source stuff, as you say, Miriam. You know, there's, a, there's people working for free on things which massive companies, well-funded companies are, are benefiting from. Um, and it kind of feels like there should be a way to... So to help people get involved in that process without them having to either work ridiculously long hours or, you know, not earn the money they should be earning um, or what have you. I mean, that, you know, doesn't seem like a great way forward. Yeah, I, I have been stressing for the past year, maybe year and a half now, this notion that we need to think about the web platform as a commons because literally everything about modern life relies on the web, like literally everything. Uh, as I was saying, like with embedded systems, you can just see the trail of you You kind of can't do things today that don't use web technology. And so in a way, this is, you know, the roads and bridges. This is the infrastructure of everything and everybody benefits from it. But who who is paying the people and, and why does it work that way, I think is like a really interesting question. How can we do better? This, I guess, sort of the overarching theme of this and i like the the idea and and sort of reiterating the idea that none of these things are fixed in stone and they have changed even in fairly recent years and there's a lot more room to do even more i think open web docs is a a, a new thing that i'm pretty excited about because it is a way to let lots of people pitch in i, I don't know what the right way to call this like in my mind i think about it like a voluntary tax <laughs> but maybe the word tax turns some people off. But And that can be to companies as well. But rather than sort of the companies dictating what gets done, that is left to a more collective decision, which I think is, mm. in a way, very, very interesting as a new thing 
to try. Open prioritization is also like trying to do something like that. Like, well, we know that not everybody can be Google or Apple. Not everybody can sort of fund the whole spec work or the whole implementation work of something. But we have lots and lots of things that just are, you know, we have potholes and <laughs> we have like lots of things that could be taken last miles or could be fixed or improved in, in great and important ways. Maybe there are opportunities where many of us could make that happen in place of a single entity, you know, like uh, Rachel had mentioned, like publishers don't have money to pay for this. This is an interesting thing because like, of course, most publishers, many publishers do have like considerable money, but it's where they prioritize it. And they think that like currently this is the cost benefit value proposition for me. Maybe that involves sending somebody to work on specs for a couple of years or not, or, but it's maybe a whole different thing. If we can say, here's a, here's a feature and we're not asking any one company to pay for it, but you know, maybe if a number of companies pitched in a very small amount, we can do a lot of practical pothole fixing and bridge building, you know? Yeah, I think I think that's that could be a really great way forward, and I, you know, I, I, that's why I like the idea of the open prioritization thing. So I think that's you know, so you know, we saw that with with Grid and with Bloomberg that you know they wanted that technology in the browser, and so they were willing to fund it. Um, and you know, they're obviously an enormous company, and and um, a lot of companies wouldn't have that you know the money to fund something like Grid. But yeah, as you say, there's lots of smaller things um, or things that groups of companies would get together and say, yeah, you know, we want this spec sort it out because we want to be able to implement it and, and and we can fund that because we're not we're not talking about huge amounts of money when we're talking about paying for a contractor to work on a spec you know we're talking about one person um you know and and, and there, that's actually not vast amounts of money if we're talking about just, just spec development for example so you know you'd think that there could be better routes for that i don't know yeah i think there's all kinds of interesting possibilities in fact if like anybody in the listening audience has thoughts and ideas on that share them with us because uh, i think we're constantly trying to do better, not just the people here, but standards and the whole entire ecosystem is constantly, we're aware of these things and it's just, how do we do better? Um, I think it is constantly getting better, but it only gets better when we have new ideas and try new things. I think as well, there needs to be a way for people to see that, see what the possibilities are, because there's not a huge amount of good understanding i think about just how it all works um you know to actually get to a point where you understand how this whole process works uh takes a very long time and it was only really because of the stuff i did with frontiers and actually going to w3c meetings as opposed to just CSS working group meetings that i kind of really got an understanding of the whole thing and how it how it goes together so you know expecting you know companies to fund things well how do they find out that that's even a possibility um, you know, if they're not embedded in this stuff already, and that's so that's I think that piece is is also interesting. You know, how how can we expose the fact that it's possible to do you know what Bloomberg did, for example? You know, how do we expose that um, to to more companies so they realise that actually it is possible to to contribute um, to either getting a spec completed if that's the issue, or paying for implementation work if that's the issue. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether there's a huge understanding that that's even a possible thing. I would say the same thing for uh, getting involved, actually doing the work, right? There's no, uh, there's no how to write a spec. There's no way that you sort of build up from small specs to large specs. You know, I somebody invited me to do this, and then I just tried to figure it out. There's not a, there's not a training course. <laughs> Um, no, you just have uh, to ask other people in the working group, and depending on, yeah, I mean that's it. I, yeah. I find that quite difficult. You know, I'm I'm fairly I sort of think, oh, am I just being stupid, not understanding this thing, and, and not wanting to go and pester people constantly? You know, right? Yeah, and and I I didn't really see that. I mean, I've been in the field for quite a while, and I didn't really see that as an option for like, oh, that's a job I could go get or an expensive hobby I could go get or find people to pay me. I mean, it wasn't really on my radar as an option to become a spec writer. Uh, and I don't know if, if that's something that other people think of or would be interested in, or um, if there's ways to make that feel more available as a potential path. Yeah. Cause I, I think when I have these 
discussions with people, they sort of say, but anyone can contribute. And it's true, anyone can contribute. But you know, to actually come along and propose a change to a spec on the CSS Working Group repo, I mean, that's quite a, a big deal, really. Um, and then just as well as that, the whole what's going to happen when you do that, the whole sort of bike shedding and, and discussion, which if you're not used to how that goes you know, may well seem, and I've seen, you know, I've seen it in the past, you know, people have come with perfectly reasonable suggestions that just happen to have been discussed to death, you know, before, and for whatever reason, they're not, they're not going to work. Um, and so this person kind of gets shut down. Um, and then they're just like, oh, oh, you know, they don't really want my input kind of thing. Um, and so all of that, I think, is is just very difficult to to sort of penetrate and get into and be in a position where you can start to contribute and not feel like you're just being knocked back all the time yeah yeah that is that is actually a surprisingly difficult thing because if you have come from the outside you experience some of that right like you experience some of seeing what seemed like a very reasonable idea get i don't know seemingly short shrift or we've already talked about that it's not gonna stop trying to make fetch happen it's not gonna happen right like um, yeah but even some that do end up happening, you know, why did it take us 12 years to do container queries? Well, mm. there's good reasons for that. That's but... exactly what I was going to say. Like, it is actually, you know, we we're saying like, no way you can sort of like lift the veil and see, like, just seems like, you know, one day we decided let's do container queries, <laughs> you know, or or one day we decided like, let's do grid. But, you know, there's years of effort and things behind that that go unseen. And I know that like I've heard people in in talks and uh, on Twitter and things say like you know we can get things done really quickly if we want to like if the CSS working group just really feels productive and wants to set their mind to it they could make anything happen like you know we did grid and flexbox in what like six months and it's like no <laughs> no yeah. there are many years before that six months where you became you know aware of and started paying attention that went into that yeah i think that i mean i think that the the sort of the patience and that's because i i talk quite a lot you know it, when i sort of do my various talks and things about css i i often include stuff about the process and about how things are made and i, and I do point to how long things have taken and why they've taken that long and why they couldn't you know something couldn't have happened because we didn't have the things that go before it that made it possible um and and I think that's, yeah, there's a lack of understanding of that. And, and I mean, why should people understand that? I mean, you know, you don't have to understand all of these intricacies uh, to become involved. But I think, yeah, I think it, it is just difficult to, to get people past that hurdle. And, you know, if they're not used to discussing things in the way, in this sort of robust way, which things are discussed, and people are, are typically very friendly, but tend to be quite direct when discussing things that are going to go into a CSS spec. And it's, it's certainly not rubbishing ideas. It's just speak in their mind about it but yeah if you're not used to that kind of discussion around around your idea it, it can seem quite harsh I think. There's also just you know one of the strengths of CSS is how interconnected it is in a sort of built for design systems one part of a design affects other parts of a design that's really powerful but it also means we've got this huge number of specs that are all intertwined in ways that are maybe not obvious until you dig into it. So most of us aren't Elica. Most of us aren't spending our full time uh, understanding all of the different specs. So it can be confusing even, even once you're working on them, if you have a focus and you don't really know all of the places that it might impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. And I mean, generally people are, are are pretty helpful if you ask questions but they're busy people too and so it's you know it, it's a very i think in general most most people are quite surprised as to the small number of people who are actually working on this stuff um you know there's not many people writing you know layout specs for example and and so it's sort of you know quite difficult sometimes to and to just have a question answered or, or what have you particularly if you're starting out and it you've got all of that to get over um, you don't quite know what you're asking yet. Yeah, absolutely. I think that thing about time is like super important to all this. One of the things that I have worked on a lot is incubation. Also, where possible, enabling things to be polyfilled so that you could 
it's a whole different thing to come around in, I don't know, 2007 and say, here's this idea we have for flexible box layout. <laughs> it's like very complicated and we need people to comment on it. Just to do that alone, even once, like is a pretty significant ask of your time. The way that I learn about whether I actually like a thing is by using it. Like lots of things sound good. <laughs> like app cache sounded good. Like it sounded good. But then you try to use it and you're like, oh, yeah, this is terrible, actually. Like so many things that we've tried sound really good. And then when you try to use them, then you have lots more questions and comments like something doesn't work as you expect it to work. And you only realize that when you go to use it. I think one of the things that has been really helpful recently is like the ability to turn on like experimental web platform features and have origin trials and mm -hmm. things like that where we can as quickly as possible, like give people something and say, yeah, just try it and use your questions. And here, here's a polyfill and you could make it work and it will have some cost, but like this way you can potentially like use a real thing and maybe accomplish something, which is at the end of the day, what most people want to do in the first place and comment on it before it becomes a standard and let us know where it doesn't meet your hmm. expectations or criteria this is currently harder with css but that's part of what houdini is about i know we did this with a bunch of things like inner and focus visible and we got a lot of really really useful feedback and improve things quite a lot but it reminds me also of the way that open ui is approaching things i, I mean in in a format where it's easier to it's easier to prototype it's harder to prototype css it's easier to prototype components but trying to build out custom elements web components uh, that sort of prove the concept before moving them into a browser but i think the also also a uh, thing that's interesting with that there's more and more of these community groups opening up um, which maybe are that path in uh, that way to start writing spec proposals, uh, start getting involved without needing membership or uh, invited expert status. Anybody can get involved in a community group. And there are spec proposals mm. coming through those community groups. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much understanding there is of, of how that, that stuff works, you know, out there in, in developer land. I mean, the... The stuff about having stuff behind flags and and um, origin trials is is interesting because I I mean you know I'm sure we all remember the the vendor prefix mess um, that, <laughs> that that sort of preceded that and uh, um, and I think you know looking at the history of like flexbox and grid kind of I think is is the, the sort of highlights the the issue of, of shipping stuff with prefixes um, and ending up with three versions of flexbox versus um, the fact that grid appeared to just kind of appear out of nowhere uh, because all the once all the flags were, were removed um, and so it is harder to get feedback on css features when things are behind flags uh, which really was the start of my sort of uh, grid advocacy was because i realized that without someone showing how it would work to people no one was going to think about it until it actually arrived if it ever arrived because if there wasn't interest in it maybe it wouldn't arrive um, and so that was really what I was doing was trying to, and there was a period where I was just mocking stuff up. There was a period between the IE version and and it ending up in, in Chrome where I was essentially just mocking up all my examples so I could show people how it was going to work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's and Houdini would make a lot of that stuff, I think, easier these days. But yeah, it's an interesting one. Trying to get trying to get excitement and and feedback on things which are hidden behind flags is is also um, some sometimes a bit challenging. Yeah, I think I think the the interesting things that go into that are like uh, like I say, you have to uh, like I imagine that was very time consuming for you to. I mean, what you're effectively doing is the paper version of web platform tests, right? Yeah, <laughs> like you're like here is the here is the input and here is the result. Yeah. But that means you have to like take a lot of time to make sure that that's right, you know, um, and that's a that's a big ask of a lot of people's time. And at the end of it, they don't get something right. Like they don't other than a feeling that they understand it and mm. maybe helped provide feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very, very possible that it f could be five years before you see that in a way that you can use it 
even in one browser. <laughs> That's like an unfortunate cost benefit thing for developers to consider. So the the more we can get to meeting developers where they are and saying like, well, I can give you this sort of, you know, um, theory and lesson, but go play with it and then mm. come back and let's talk about it. I think that's like very, very relevant without it sort of escaping the realm of the vendor prefix. Mm. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that's, that's why, you know, with grid, it was once there was a very solid implementation in, in Chrome behind a flag, then, you know, interested people were able to play with it. I was able to, I mean, the, the grid by example site I made was exactly for that. I made tons of examples and let people look, enable that, that flag and just go and look at these examples and see what you think. Um, so it's kind of that trying to create an easy route in uh, for people to play with to play with it. Um, and I think that's it's a great site, by the way. It's like really, really great. Yeah, I think it, it, it got a lot of people interested because it just it, it see it removed that barrier. It wasn't like oh, you need to go and understand the spec and build yourself some examples to be. It was like well, here's the examples. Just just toggle that flag <laughs> and have a look. And and that kind of I think caught people's imagination a bit about it. You know, because they were like immediately yeah. then a designer, you know, is going to think, oh, oh, yeah, that's that exactly solves this problem we have, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think that exposing this stuff to people, particularly with with CSS, where, you know, it's not like an API where you can just kind of talk about, oh, well, you're going to give it this and get back that. And, and that's with CSS, you kind of need to see it. And it's a lot of people are more on the design spectrum and they, they need to be able to see and experience how it's going to behave, I think, to really start offering feedback. Yeah. And like what I like about that site too is like, even for me, like seeing the examples is, it is really, really helpful. But then like having something that's a little bit more like code or dev tools mm -hmm. that you can tweak an input and, and see that your, <laughs> that your understanding of what you're seeing is correct. Yeah. Right. Like, um, I, I think those things are just so valuable. And I think, um, while they're a step further away, polyfills are even, mm -hmm better like if we can get really high quality polyfills they're even better in that they let you try to solve a real world problem yeah if you haven't checked it out the w3c tag has a great uh note that they wrote a finding a tag finding on polyfills and the evolution of the web and you know speculative polyfills are what we're talking about here not the traditional like remy sharp polyfills where three of four browsers support this thing and you just need to spackle the hole, right? Like we, we know exactly how it's going to work. And uh, we can say, if your browser supports this, then you don't need it um, because they're all going to work the same way. But these are what we're talking about is speculative polyfills. So it's like, this is an experiment. It might never actually be a thing. And if it is a thing, it might not look exactly like this. What we're trying to do is figure that out. So use the polyfill, do useful things, or try to. <laughs> and it's likely you'll find lots of useful things that you wish you could do that you can't. And we need to know that. But it lets developers like do a useful thing. Mm. So at the end of the day, the reason that a lot of people come to the CS working group is because they keep experiencing some pain and they have some idea about how to make the pain go away. You know, They have some desire to do something that they can't do. And if you say, here is a way that you could try to do that, and it's useful whether it becomes a standard or not because it will help you alleviate the pain or do the thing. But the barrier is really low now. You can tell us if it's terrible or great or whatever. Mm. That's, I think, really great. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it, what I think would be very useful and it'd be nice to see would be to, to try and promote those places and that where actually author input has changed specs for the better. Um, I, you know, I know of those sort of places in, in some of the CSS stuff, and I think that actually for when people are engaging with this very slow moving process and feel like you know, they're throwing ideas and nothing's happening about them to actually be able to see that, oh yes, you know, ideas coming from the community are being implemented, they are happening. It's not happening in time for my next project, um, but it is happening. Ideal container queries aren't quite possible in the way that we imagine them because there's so many, so much potential for infinite loop problems. But the whole thing is based on ideas people have been talking about for 12 years. It's But the idea is not new, and there have been polyfills out there doing something container query-like for several years now, which was also helpful. I mean, we 
we got to look at all of those speculative polyfills and build off of that. Yeah, I mean, that's something I often say to people uh, in terms of, um, you know, bringing their ideas is, is, is about those use cases. So it's like, you know, if you're having to write JavaScript to do something that could potentially be just, you know, baked into CSS, that's actually a really great starting point because you've got a use case there and you've got something that works and maybe it doesn't perform very well. I mean, um, masonry would be a great example of that. You know, people are trying to do this masonry layout and they're doing it in JavaScript and it, it really doesn't perform great. So once we've got grid, well, can't we have something like masonry in CSS? And it turns out that we probably can. Um, and and it's that, that stuff, you know, what, what people are already trying to do um, and having to do and they're doing it in a, a not great way. That's a brilliant way to contribute, really, because we already know there's a use case there because it's happening. Right. And sometimes that ends up looking very much like the tools that people were using. Uh, we're sort of able to take it in full and just port the idea over. And sometimes it ends up looking very different, but containing some part of the idea. I mean, we can still, we learned from SAS variables and then created something entirely different from SAS mm -hmm. variables, but still those preprocessors proved the concept. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've, I've developed products and I, I kind of see that the developing the web platform is very, very similar. You know, you have a product, you had a content management system and, and people come with ideas for, the, for this thing. And um, typically what you implement is not their idea exactly as they came because what you tend to do is get lots of other people's ideas too and try and solve a whole bunch of use cases with that thing um, or see if there's two very similar things that perhaps are really the same thing at core and I think the web platform really is 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 just very similar to any other kind of product development you know you need to get those use cases and bounce them around a bit to find out is that the only thing that needs to happen like that or are there other things that are that are similar um and and sort of work them all together and i think that you know the, the length of time some of these things take is is just that you know we need to get enough use cases to be sure that this thing is is going to be useful to as many people as possible when it's implemented um and obviously this and then also how is it going to impact grid how is it going to impact flexbox how is it going to work in the block model? How's it going to work with Ruby text? How's it going to work with, you know, even beyond the basic use cases that you're trying to solve, how is the idea going to interact with everything else that's yeah. already there? And, and, and yeah, and the stakes are so much higher with, with the web platform, because once it's out there, that's it. <laughs> it's staying out there. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's not like we can do it and we can deprecate stuff very easily or, or what have you. It's, you know, we don't break the web. So, it, the stakes are fairly high. If we're going to have something there, we want to make sure it, it is good and performs well and doesn't have accessibility issues and uh, security issues and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I really like the uh, comment that you made there about how it's a lot like a, a, a product. It, it is a lot like a product if you can imagine like the largest product you can <laughs> yeah. possibly imagine that can't ever break, yeah. like can't ever release a new like a new edition that is completely incompatible with past edition somehow. Web 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. For other competitors who have their entire own products to manage. But thinking about that is actually really helpful. And like I've written and talked a lot about that. Um, so many things we look at uh, about the platform, we tend to not look at that. And I remember, I think it, I think it was Jen Simmons though. Maybe. Yeah. I think it was Jen Simmons that said at some point, like as soon as she went to work for Mozilla, you know, she had been in, on the web for a long time. Like everybody knew who Jen was. And then as soon as she went to Mozilla, I think she tweeted something like, you know, as soon as I got there, I, I realized like, oh, suddenly, oh, right. Like this is a product, <laughs> right? Like it, 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 like it seems so obvious at some level, but, you know, there are people with skills and time and you know, like you, you can't just be like, we're going to do this thing because it's the right thing to do and just make a thousand of those decisions a day. Because like at the end of the day, you need to have the people to do the thing. You have to find a way to prioritize, get things done, ship things, fix bugs, you know, and, um, uh, and convince these companies that it will, will be profitable for them. Yeah, somehow. exactly. And it, it's like, it is really, it's really interesting to look at things through that lens, because as Mia said, like very much earlier, ultimately, th there is some bent of priority to who who is sponsoring that people 
want to sponsor things that they think are most important, but also they want to sponsor things that they can get done. And just like any other product, there's all of these hidden things. It might be that you have 10 requests for thing A, and you could roughly sort out a thing A. You know you can do that, but you know it's going to cost you six months worth of work. You have a bunch of requests for thing B, and thing B is maybe the most important thing, but there's some re-architecture happening in your product. It would just be way more cost efficient to wait until that's done. So you're going to wait until that's done. And then you have things C, D, E that are, maybe they're not important, like they're not as important, but you have free resources and those people can do those things. And so you get those things. Wait, done. is thing B subgrid? It could be subgrid. Yes, it could be subgrid. <laughs> I mean, it could be it could be subgrid or it could be like uh, aspects of MathML or it it could be things about container queries even. So yeah, I mean, it it's full of uh, interesting. It's full of interesting things when you begin to think about it through sort of that lens a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it's. I mean, for me, it's sort of trying to e- explain. I think a lot of web developers sort of think, well, you know, that there's there's all these enormous companies sat there um, on their hands refusing to implement, uh, you know, these things. And and so something I've I've tried to do is kind of show a bit how the sausage is made, I guess, you know, when I do these talks and so on. Just, you know, explaining the, the why things take so long, the, the number of decisions, but also the the fact that it's a very specialist thing to write these specs and then to implement them. And it's actually a very, although they're huge companies, uh, there are very few people, say, able to implement, you know, layout in in, in a browser engine. And um, I think that's it's helpful to people out there in the community who want to contribute to understand the process a bit more, I think. All of this is really, really helpful. The more of it we do. It, it is also relatedly funny how how much discussion there is in the web community that portrays things as being sort of entirely political, like mm. Google versus Apple. <laughs> yeah. And do you know what I mean? Like the Yeah, I mean, the very, very odd, I, I, I see often in articles, like really weird assumptions that people have made about why something hasn't happened or has happened. Um, yeah. That you kind of like, I, I know full well, was just because like, there was no one to do it right then. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, like I know that it's because, like, we're currently implementing the next gen layout system. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And and then you'll see, you know, this article where someone's, you know, suggesting that this is due to some enormous battle, or someone didn't want to do it, or and I'm like, where did you get this information from? You know, it's like or just even making, very broad, just making stuff up. You know? Even sort of very broad conspiracies that yeah. sort of fit a narrative, right? And but yeah, I don't think that they're silly necessarily like i think people are doing the best they can with the information that they have and i mean they are probably filling too many gaps yeah it's, it's, it's easy to not see that i guess is what i'm saying yeah and, i think i mean you know it's sort of historic i think there's i think there's kind of this story about warring browser vendors that comes from yes. you know the the browser wars time um now and I obviously was involved at that time with the Web Sanders project. And I, there's this kind of mythology almost that's kind of carried through. Yes. And, you know, and I've, I've had it directly asked me, you know, people are like, oh, do they not all fight, you know, with each other at the CSS working group meeting? I'm like, no, no. Most, mostly they're just all sort of chin scratching and wondering if it's possible. You know, it's like. Um, it's mainly a death match. Is yeah. <laughs> what people imagine, like, it's like a. Uh, uh, kung fu movie yeah and, uh, but I mean, i'm also yeah. like you know you can search the archives if you really want to know what was said about this or that you know it's all there um <laughs> but but yeah i think there is a sort of mythology about what actually happens which doesn't really match what really happens um if people came to meetings expecting a, a fight then they'd be sadly disappointed <laughs> I, i'm not saying that there are that there is nothing like that i mean there are sort of you know business slash political struggles hmm. that like of course yeah right the speck of truth is that these companies do have cultures and do have things that they prioritize and uh it's true that apple is sometimes prioritizing something different than what google is prioritizing yes. for business reasons but it's also true that as soon as you start working with these companies they're made up of individuals who have different right. ideas and they disagree with yeah. each other and uh, there's different departments working on different aspects of something so google isn't always coordinated in 
what they're proposing to the web. They're having internal struggles too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and 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 you know, and then how much is isn't? Oh, this browser is refusing to do it for political reasons. It might be that browser is just saying, uh, "I don't think we can do this because old code." You know, <laughs> it's like um... it is easy to imagine, and I think there is this mythology that leads people to believe that everything is this, but most things are actually and. In- entirely more mundane boring yeah <laughs> things it, 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 it's is this even possible to implement um in this particular engine and that might be different you know it could be something is, is super easy for for firefox to, to implement and almost impossible for for chrome to do just because of the way things are you know and, and i think that's that's all of that is, is stuff that yeah will get them painted as oh this browser is holding back the web or and all this sort of thing and um everyone's looking for the new ie6 you know <laughs> like which, which right. is the, which is the terrible browser today you know right. um yeah and and um, you know it, it's 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 not particularly helpful yeah and it's it's not even going to happen in the same way again now that browsers are mm. evergreen and releasing more on like six week schedules rather than six year schedules. We're just not likely to see the same sort of. Yeah, it's also interesting with companies like Egalia and just how many of the browser engineers are working on multiple browser engines. Yeah. That that's that is I mean that and that is really helpful. I mean just in in terms of, you know, moving things forward because if you've got someone who actually understands the internals of of more than one engine is 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 super useful and you see that in discussion thanks for coming on i think that there was a whole lot of interesting things here and thanks for effort and uh i'm really happy that you're that you're both involved and that there are ways that people are funding your work now and uh, if other people have needs for those kinds of skills we can there's a small community of people that is doing some of the really great work and uh, we'd like to help to connect you. Oh, it's, it's it's been really really great to to have this discussion. It's it's always fun to to talk about the sort of behind the scenes things, and I hope it's been interesting to to people listening. So thank you. Yeah, and I hope that we can continue to sort through these questions. I mean, I think there's there are a lot of open questions about how do we make this more accessible to more people? Um, how do we get more diverse viewpoints involved? Uh, and fund it. And I'd like to see those conversations continue happening.